Jasmine Warga is a Jordanian-American author whose middle grade book, Other Words for Home, about the journey of a 12-year-old Syrian refugee, hit the New York Times bestseller list and has earned multiple awards, including the esteemed John Newberry Honor. She is also the author of two young adult books, which has been translated into over 25 different languages. Jasmine joins me today to discuss her writing and her career. Welcome, Jasmine, and, and thank you very much for coming on Bradshaw Live. Hi, Brad. Thanks for having me. Your family does have an immigration story from Jordan. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so my dad's from Jordan. He was born in Amman, and he went to medical school in Jordan and then was lucky enough to get the opportunity to do a residency in Canada, which is his first foray into North America. Like lots of immigrant stories, his dependent upon the fact he had one uncle who was already in New York City who had earned enough money to pay for the $400 plane ticket to fly my dad to Canada, which without that, he wouldn't have been able to come. Right. He did his training there and then was accepted into another training in Cincinnati. So he arrived in Cincinnati. And I remember when we were little, he would always drive by this one park and show my brother and I the bench that he sat on when he first got to Cincinnati and was like, I don't know anyone. I have $3. And on like a day after that story, he met someone who was another Middle Eastern person at University of Cincinnati to the Middle Eastern Students Association, who was uh, like, hey, there's this like party, you should come with me, you can meet some people. And when my dad arrived, I realized it was not like a party, it was a pre-planned dinner party. And Moya, who's his friend, was dating my mom's really good friend, Susan, but it was my mom. Oh, there's a setup. I hear, I already hear it. There's a setup now, right? Yeah. So, um, he met my mom that way. He was at an uninvited guest of the dinner party. And because he was so mortified, realizing he'd broken all these cultural norms, he took, um, everyone out for dinner a couple nights later with money that he didn't have. He always says, but he wanted to see my mom again. And so that was sort of how they met. And, and, then, and then I guess your mom was born in America. My mom was born in America. So yeah. then after so, they got married, she sponsored him for his green yeah, card. Yeah, yeah, So he got his um, citizenship when I was in first grade. And I remember we went to the ceremony all together. And before that, because I'd been like kindergarten and first grade, we were learning similar things to what he had to learn for the citizenship test. So we practiced together, like That's funny, other right. religions. So what is Other Words from Home about? The book is about a 12-year-old girl named Jude who, due to the growing conflict in her home country of Syria, is forced to move across the Atlantic Ocean with her mother, leaving her dad and her brother uh, back in Syria. And they resettle in Cincinnati, Ohio, where her uncle has been living for some time. Her uncle... I'm a cell in Cincinnati, working as a doctor, married to an American woman, and has a daughter who's about Jude's age. So Jude and her mom move in with them. And the book is about sort of the struggles and the joys of starting this new life in this new place in America, and is inspired sort of by the resilience and bravery and heart of all of these kids that we see in the U.S. who come on here kind of not out of a choice, but out of necessity, and how they piece together a life here. How did you decide to write about a Syrian refugee? Why that topic? There's a lot of things that play into that. The first is my own background. So my father's an immigrant from Jordan. And growing up, uh, we were very close uh, with a Syrian family in Cincinnati. And the first sort of spark I have idea for the book came um, when I was um, at dinner at this family's house. And I was being introduced to all of these relatives from the family that had recently come over uh, because of the conflict. And this was back in like early fall of 2013. So the conflict in Syria hadn't reached this boiling point of being on like the front page news of Western media yet. I had sort of an inkling that about the unrest, but didn't really understand right. and the situation on the ground. But I was actually like less interested in the politics of the situation and more interested in the relationship dynamics I was watching between the cousins who had been born in Syria and the cousins who had been born in America. And I started thinking about how many American families have this story of family members who live on either side of the ocean and what does that mean? And what would it be like for me um, when I was a kid, if my 
Jordanian cousins had moved to live with us, especially with all the like complicated feelings I had about my hyphenated identity, especially Western media isn't very generous or humanizing oftentimes to Muslim Americans or Middle Eastern Americans. How did 9-11 affect you and your family as Arab Americans? In eighth grade, we moved to a new school district and 9-11 happens and no one at the school really knows what my background. And I'm hearing all these horrible things at school about Muslims and about Arabs. And I don't say anything. I tried to hide my identity from my classmates. When did you become proud of being an Arab American? I think around 17, it started to change. And I think it was from being exposed to like more post-colonial lit. Like I remember reading like White Teeth by Zadie Smith and having this epiphany of like all the things that I was afraid of about my identity were the things that gave me a unique perspective. I didn't find books particularly about Arab Americans or Muslim Americans, but I found books about the immigrant experience. And that sort of made me realize this was something that I had a lot that I wanted to say. And made me again, like want to write these books so other kids don't spend a long part of their adolescence feeling like they have to choose between their identities. Like I felt like I could only be American or I could be Muslim. Like that's what the media was telling me. And I want to write these books that kind of blend those hyphenates together and show that like that is a fully American thing and a fully American story. How much do you touch on in the book, the actual immigration process and how difficult it is to leave Syria to come to America? I knew specifically that I wanted to write about a refugee like Jude who while her journey is full of struggles, is an immensely privileged refugee story and that she already has family in the United States. Her uncle's um, fairly well off in the U.S. where he has a doctor and is able to afford this plane ticket to bring her and her mother to the U.S. I, in my head, envision that what happened is they were able to obtain a legal visa and then probably that visa has, has expired somewhere in the book, but those details aren't really right in the book but that's the I guess the path that I saw a lot in um refugee communities before the Syrian war that was how what would happen people would get a visa come here and not leave but yeah. since the war, there is no embassy to go get a visa exactly do you touch on Islamophobia do you touch on how she's treated by other children so there's a pivotal moment in the book where a terror attack occurs, not even in the U.S. I think it's left vague, but it's implied that it's somewhere in Europe. And it's Jude's first experience with what the news cycle is like here in the U.S. when um, an Islamic terror attack happens. And her friend, one of her friends at school, who's also Muslim, tells her, like, now you're going to learn what it's like to be Muslim in America, how you're going to be asked to apologize for this thing you had nothing to do with, disavow it, etc., and um, later on, a couple of days after, Jude has a pretty um, tense situation with a passerby on the street because it was just a couple of weeks ago um, that she started wearing a hijab or a headscarf right. and all of the comments and misunderstandings about that practice. So I think the book like definitely dives into those things. I view books for young people as conversation starters. Like I want to hold space for kids to be able to read this book and then ask questions about Islamophobia or talk about it as opposed to like, trying to tell them exactly how they should feel about it, but more hopefully spark curiosity. Can you tell us what the Newbery Award is? Yes, the Newbery Award is an award that's given out annually by the American uh, Library Association or colloquially in children's publishing known as ALA. And every year there's a different committee of librarians and they read 500 books a, a year. Like the committee looks at basically all of the potential books that could qualify. You just have to have a book that was published within the year by a U.S. publisher. And uh, they debated out, and, and the process is kind of secretive. And then on the day of the ALA Awards, um, early in the morning, so my phone started ringing at what was like 5 a.m. Chicago time, um, and I heard the committee's uh, chair's voice um, telling me that the book was a John Newbery honor book. And I started crying because... Growing up, I, I remember um, those books. Those are the books we read in school that had these stickers, and it's such an American award. And so right. to see this sticker on this particular book saying that this story is an American award um, is meaningful to me in a way that's 
like much bigger than just the career implications. It meant a lot to me um, in the bigger scheme of what that means for saying that like Muslim kids are American kids and Arab kids are American kids and that sticker kind of validates that sentiment. And not only does that sticker validate it, but the fact that you're on the bestseller list, that means people are buying it and people want to know this story. It's amazing the uh, letters, well, more emails these days that I get from kids who are like, this is the first time I ever saw like a Muslim girl like me in a book, or this is the first time I ever saw a family like mine, or I also have just recently moved to the United States. And those letters mean everything to me. And then on the flip side, I love getting letters too from kids who maybe live in rural communities where there isn't a ton of diversity and saying, you know, this is the first time I ever encountered a story about a Muslim kid. And it's made me think so much more differently about what a hijab actually is, or that I don't need to be scared of these things that I thought I was. And that's also like super meaningful to me. Um, and I think that's the amazing thing about books is that they help expose us to life experiences that may be different from our own lived experience. Well, actually, a very interesting thing that I read about your book is that you wrote it in verse and not prose. I initially wrote the book in prose. My first two books were in prose. I've always loved poetry, but I've never really considered myself to be a poet, in part um, because of I thought of poetry as just being like Shakespeare sonnets. And it wasn't until I got to college and was introduced to more contemporary modern poetry that has a free verse form, which is what the book is. And so I actually feel like lots of kids love free verse uh, because they realize that poetry doesn't have to be this like stuffy, unmoving thing. It's more just like kind of sparse, easy to read, fast reading poems, which um, luckily has been great for ESL kids, which I didn't even think about when I was writing the book, but I hear from teachers now that it works really well for them because it's these like shorter sentences and lots of white space. Right, right, wow. Okay, 1980s, which is, you know, you're going back about 40 years. How did your mom's family accept your mom marrying a foreign man? Were they concerned about immigration, a different religion? Yeah, all of those things. And I'd say they didn't feel great about it. I would say they're still Islamophobic. And the way that I think lots of people kind of decentralize their racism of like, they learned to accept my dad and obviously they accept my brother and I, but they like in their heads somehow were different than like what Fox News is talking about. From the time you decided to be a professional writer to the time when you started, where you were able to survive as a writer, how many years did it take? So I got serious about trying to actually write for a publication in like the last quarter of my senior year. So let's just say that's like March of 2010. And I sold my first book to HarperCollins in August of 2013. So three-ish three years. Year process. For writers, that's a pretty fast rise to publishing by a major publishing company. So yeah, I also think, especially there's a lot of luck and timing and publishing. Like I had the right type of book at the right moment, like, which is something you just can't predict for. But at the time that I was trying to find an agent and sell my first book, contemporary realistic young adult books, like John Green had blue open the market and like all of them, that's the type of book they wanted. And I was just really lucky that that's the book that I had. And so um, it easily could have taken me 10 more years So what are you working on now? My next book um, is coming out in May of 2021. And it's called The Shape of Thunder. And it's another middle grade novel that uh, kind of deals with the trauma of mass gun violence. What it's like to be a kid today and go to school and not necessarily feel safe. So where can people find all your books? Anywhere that books are sold. Also, obviously, on Amazon or on barnesandnoble.com, um, target.com. What is your American dream that it means something different to everybody? And uh, have you achieved it? So the first thing is broader and it's bigger than myself is that my dream is for America to be the America that so many immigrants dream of, which is this place where no matter what your color is, your religion is, your gender, your sexual orientation, that you have an equitable chance at achieving your dreams. And right now, I think we all know America falls short of that, but my dream is for it to be that place, especially for our kids. And I think that my dream, which is linked to what I'm going to do now, is to write 
books that help support our young people to make America fulfill that dream of where they see themselves in these books and they feel seen and loved and supported in the books. Because I think our country is only as good as our young people and how we support them. Well, Jasmine Waga, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And and good luck uh, on you. your next book and, and congratulations on all your amazing success so far. And I appreciate thank you so much. Thank you for having me.